this is Will Sanchez. This show is dedicated to all the little furries that are gone to heaven, especially Dante, beloved pet of my two guests tonight. They are Joanne Pate and Eric Fernandez. I heard about Joanne from a prior guest last year, known as simply Rob, a poet. He tells this wonderful story. I was leaving my house and I get a phone call from Joanne um, asking me, are you, are you coming? Are you coming to see me? And I was like, well, yeah, Joanne, I'm, I'm on my way, but what are you doing calling me? And she says, aren't you supposed to be running? She says, I am running. I'm in the Bronx, but I have the flu, so I need cough drops, I need gum. Oh, heck, bring me both. It was such a heartwarming story that I had to look up Joanne, and here she is with Eric. Thank you. Thank you for having us on the show. Thank you for having us on the show. Welcome. Joanne, let's get started, as I do with all my shows. Tell us a little bit about your background. I was originally born in Queens and raised in the Bronx. Uh, I come from an Italian-American family. I have my bachelor's degree from NYU, and I, we live in Riverdale, and I uh, currently work at Morgan Stanley. And I'm an avid runner, and I belong to the Van Cortlandt Track Club, and I take a lot of pride in that. Before we jump into the Van Cortlandt Track Club, as a youngster, were you very much involved in athletics? I come from an athletic family, so um, sort of basketball when it was the CYO camps. My dad tried without success to teach me how to play girls basketball. And then I was on the softball team for my high school, which was St. Catherine's Academy, for four years. Mm -hmm. And I was always sort of a, a runner. So I started running when I was around 14, 15 years old, but very short distances, two to three miles. And then when I was around 23, I, I started to take it more seriously and increase my mileage. I went to NYU. I have a degree in behavioral communication. From a human resources perspective, developing individuals to be, to be the best that they can be, to buy into the corporate culture. And what is it about running that you know, catches your imagination? Well, first of all, it's very physical, so I like the, the release, the runner's high, the adrenaline. And then um, you find there's a bunch of kindred spirits, you know. I used to run by myself for a very long time, and then I got involved with the track club, and now I almost never run by myself. Um, but, you know, challenging yourself, um, picking different distances. There was a time where I didn't think I could even run a 10K. I'm like, you know, oh, my God, over six miles, no way. And then, <laughs> you know, a half marathon, I thought, well, this is where I draw the line. And then I realized I could run 15 miles, and then I thought, well, maybe I will give the marathon a shot. And that's sort of how it snowballed. Okay. Well, was there any particular course you took or mentor that did Actually, I so I was running on my own, right? And I would do this, these all-out sprints and get really tired. I didn't understand about pacing. And I became a member of New York Roadrunners. And I took a beginner's running class back in 2002. And I learned about pacing. And I thought, oh, this is much more comfortable. Oh, this is with the, uh, the Glovers? Yes, yes. Shelly, yes. Beginners. The intermediate to beginners, yes. So and Shelley that certainly was, was me, yes. And, you know, the bridal path in Central Park over and over again. We used to work for Bear Stearns. And so we would do the J.P. Morgan Corporate Challenge every year. And I thought, oh, this is great, 3.1 miles, you know, the 5K distance. And then I don't know what year it was, but we had a big snowstorm. And it was a, uh, a 15K. And it was the first time I was ever going to attempt 9.3 miles. And I thought, well, surely they're going to cancel this because it's snowing. But they did not. And they probably made it a fun run. Actually, back then, they still timed us. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> that was probably back in 2003. I've done five New York City marathons, and I ran the Hamptons Marathon as well. OK, but tell us about uh, the first one you did, the first marathon. Was it New York? It was New York City. Got to be special. It was very, very special. Um, I So I joined Van Cortland Track Club in 2005 knowing that I was going to run the 2006 New York City Marathon as my first marathon. I was terrified. Terrified was your first reaction, okay? Yeah, because it's 26.2 miles and oh my God, you know, what if I can't finish? No, not an option. I'll crawl to the finish if I have to. And so I met one of my best friends, Sarah Baglio, through Van Cortland Track Club. We both were signed up for the marathon. She's like, I don't think I can do this. I'm like, I don't think I can do this either. And she was with the program team for kids. So we ran with the Dirty Dozen, which meant we were, at that, that point we were 12 minute milers. Okay. And it was just a fantastic experience. Um, my family came to see me at different points along the marathon route. I had friends come, to, it was like a big party. And what we decided was we're gonna enjoy it. 
we are just going to enjoy the marathon no matter what happens even if we have to walk pieces of it which we didn't we ended up being able to run and it was just it was like a 26 mile block party it was fantastic it is new york is fantastic and it was addicting okay well let's turn over to eric eric Introduce yourself to the audience. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I have a family of uh, one sister. I went to school at New Utrecht High School. I didn't go to college. I did not go to college, but uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from life. And uh, I've always been involved in athletics. I started with boxing, uh, you know, hanging out at 9, 10 years old on the street with your friends, playing tag, and, you know, you get into these little scuffles and fights. My father said, oh, you think you're tough? You know, and I was a little overweight as a kid. So he said, you're fat. It's time for, <laughs> it's time to get moving. <laughs> so uh, he introduced me to Ortiz Boxing Gym. And that's when I got my first taste of any type of athletic uh, sport. I was 10 years old. That's a big step. Yeah, so, okay. you know. <laughs> and your dad was with you? My dad was with me the whole step of was the way. Was he a boxer, too? He was a professional boxer, and he came out the army. I get in the ring, he ties up my gloves, you know. And he's like, okay, see that guy over there? You're going to spar with him. Same kid, you know. 10 years old, a little bit of heavy like me, but you know, this kid's been in the gym for a couple of months and I've never <laughs> got hit so much in my life. <laughs> but it was a wake up call and I was upset. I was like, I want to learn how to do this because I don't want that to happen again. And he said, that's what I was looking for. I said, if you would have came back crying and moaning, I knew this is not for you. Mm -hmm. From there, that's when my journey started with boxing. And I was boxing from the ages of 10 to 13. And it was fun. My father was a drill sergeant. Got to run, you got to box, you got to be in the gym, you got to get better. That kind of translates now for the way I work with my clients because I am in the fitness industry. Oh, okay. He just taught me just to work hard. And at the end of the day, hard work pays off. So from the ages of 10 and 13, I boxed. And uh, after that, you know, my relationship with my father was, you know, it was a little rocky. So there was times where, he, you know, he would go, come and go. And other trainers, they saw I had talent. They were like, hey, I'll work with you, but it wasn't the same. Right, right. I did I did take a step back from the boxing gym, but uh, we used to play a lot of football in my neighborhood, and I started getting better you know, at football as well. And this is what sparked me to play f high school football. We were playing basketball in a park. Um, you know, being kids, 13 and a half years old, you're trying different things. You were drinking beers, smoking okay. a little pot. All right, and it's it's honest. It's it, you know, it was very hot. It was very humid, and I remember I, we I went up for a jump shot and I fell on my butt. When I got up, my speech was slurred. Uh, I wasn't coordinated. I couldn't really walk a straight line, just like that, snap of a finger. Hmm. Uh, my mother administered me in the hospital. I'm laying in the hospital, by Israel, and I'm looking up at TV. The Jets and Giants are playing. You know, the annual preseason game, and I look up there. You know, I have the football background. I told myself, I want to do this. You know, I said, I'm going to get out this hospital and I'm going to play. You know, and I'm going to get, I'm going to beat this. Whatever it is, I'm going to beat it. Because I thought I would never recover from it. I, I couldn't even talk. You yeah. know, it was very scary. Yeah. They said it might have been a stroke of some sort, a minor this stroke. Is at 13? 13 years old. At the end of the day, when I got out of that situation, I signed up for a school that was out of my zone called New Utrecht High School. I signed up for the football team. You know, and first day on the team, first practice, these guys were six feet, 200 pounds in high school. <laughs> they were getting recruited by Penn State. You know, these guys have some good resumes. They were really good athletic players. And I just got thrown into the fire again. As well, I got knocked down hard. And I told myself, you know what? I'm not, it's not gonna happen to me. I'm gonna overcome this. Okay. You know, I'm gonna be one of the impact players here. Okay. And it, I took a lot of time just exercising and learning about the body. I majored in sports medicine in high school, so I took the knowledge of that, and I incorporated that in the weight room to get myself stronger, faster. My coach saw my work ethic, and he told me, hey, why don't you take the, the, the underclassmen under your wing, because you work hard and they look to you for that leadership, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, that's how I got started with, you know, personal training and dealing with the one-on-one -on -one person mm -hmm. and teaching them about their body and how to exercise. Mm -hmm. That time and that, point in the park where I had that minor stroke over whatever whatever it was it really it changed my life and how did you meet uh, Joanne because I have a feeling that was another major change in oh life. definitely definitely um <laughs> I was working at Equinox at the time and I see Joanne doing a you know a tricep push down you know doing some arms with her trainer and once I looked at her and we exchanged eye contact, our eyes were locked for about two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Well, it, it felt yeah. like two minutes. It, it was like 30 seconds. <laughs> it was one of those things that people say you just feel like lightning struck you. 
in that moment, I knew that I was going to marry him. I didn't know his name. I didn't know where he was from. You were a Ghana man. <laughs> <laughs> but I man. was going to have him. <laughs> and I felt the same way, you know. And uh, <laughs> She said she she kept watching me the whole time. This was like a, a span of like three months. Yeah. We didn't say anything to each other after that moment of that wow. that exchange of eye contact. Who made the first move? I did. She did? Yeah. Yeah. So I she did. walked up to him and said, uh, well, teach me how to box? Number <laughs> one, I was coming up on my, my second marathon, and I thought, if I could just have my upper body be a little bit stronger endurance-wise, that would help me. I mean, as you know, because you're a runner, it's not just your legs. You really need a stronger, good core. good core, and sometimes it'll carry you for miles, you know, even after your legs are fatigued. So I thought, well, what's my angle here? I see he's boxing. Well, well, here's my angle. So I said, oh, you're the boxing trainer? I want to get, you know, more endurance for my upcoming marathon. Would you mind, you know, training me for some boxing, which was, you know, a load of crap. You said, ding, ding. Oh, yeah. When, when she came up to me, she's like, are you the boxing guy? I was like, oh, I'm whatever guy you want me to be. We go through, I buy these six sessions, and I tell him, well, if you're any good, I'll buy some more. And I had no intention of doing that. And so after our fourth session, I took my gloves off. I was like, look. I want to date you. I don't want to box. So you'll figure it out. You'll either ask me out or you won't. Yeah. And he did. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, uh... I oblige on that. As a professional, you train women, you're not supposed to cross that line. Okay. <laughs> and well, but when, she, when she crossed the line, I said, okay. <laughs> Sounds like it worked out. So yeah, how long it did. you guys been married? We just made our third year wedding anniversary. Yes. We were together five years. Mm -hmm. Dante, I think you said you got in 2004. 2006, uh, before, the night before my first marathon. Oh. Dante was a cane corso. Um, they're Italian mastiffs, but they are, they are a breed unto themselves. They're very majestic creatures. Um, I got him from a breeder um, who I know through a friend of mine, um, a very reputable breeder. She breeds for temperament. Uh, these dogs are just phenomenal with children, with their family. And they, I cannot say enough, they are majestic creatures. They are just so full of love. And they may look imposing and large and scary looking, but they are just the sweetest, sweetest animals. They really are, and they really, they, they are family dogs. They're not dogs that you would leave outside, or, you know, some people have likened them to like pit bulls on steroids. Mm -hmm. It's completely false. He was sweet as a baby. He yeah. sit on his lap, sit on my lap. Dante liked me the minute he saw me. Yes. Really? Yeah. He did, oh, that, he loved that me. helps. <laughs> it does, it does. I mean, you... Now, did you use them in your sports uh, activities? Connie Corsos are a very large breed dog. They are more athletic than other Mastiff breeds, but they're or only, I, I would never push him past three miles, but he was really good for one loop around the flats in Van Cortland Park, which is like one and a half, and then we would walk one and a half. So he would trot along. He would that. trot along. <laughs> so happy. So happy to trot along with, with me or with him. Or I, so I, would, I would call Dante a power, a power dog. He was good from zero to 30, all out. He was strong. He was fast. But for like he 30 wasn't, seconds. He wasn't, the, he wasn't the distance guy. He wasn't. No, he wasn't he a was distance. a sprinter. He was like the Hussein Bolt. We've done a lot of crying in the last month. Our, our hearts are just broken and we feel empty. But we, we do want to get another dog. Definitely. Um, and, you know, we'll do it differently this time. If, you know, you get them young enough, we could have trained them to run five miles. Yeah. You know, slowly, trotted, yeah. sure, absolutely. But, you know, we babied him. Yeah. We spoiled yeah. him, and he was more about his cookies, and he liked to watch TV with us, mm -hmm. and he liked the air condition. <laughs> my kind of dog. <laughs> How long did he live? He just shy of his sixth birthday. He had a very rare type of cancer um, in his leg, and, you know, Oddly enough, so you know, as runners, we always talk about these injuries, right? So our hamstring hurts, or this hurts. We noticed he couldn't put his foot down, he couldn't get up, so we rushed him to the hospital. And he had something called a myxosarcoma, which is a, a tumor the size of a mango that had tied up his hamstrings. So you know, we have three heads to the hamstring. It tied two of those heads up, he could not even extend his leg anymore. So that was really, that was tough. That was tough to swallow. They sort of offered us amputation and we were going to think about it. I mean, we probably would not have done it, but we came home with the dog, and within a few hours, we realized the tumor began he was, just exploding. So we really didn't have a choice. He was in excruciating pain. He was oh, in excruciating so pain. Yeah, we witnessed that, and we were not going to no. leave him in that type of pain. No, so he, you know. Agony. So, and so we've, uh, I've not been running so much since, because running can, can sometimes, you know, people say, well, we run to, you know, get in our head. And the last place that I want to be is in my head. And most of the running that I do, uh, so Van Cortland Track Club hosts 
every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, there are these runs, and so Coach Ken, he'll tell us what to do on Tuesday. Like, that I can do. If you tell me, you know, we're doing four 800s, ill repeats, I can do that. Please just don't ask me to run anything over eight miles because I can't do it. I, I just pulled out of the wine glass marathon um, because it's too much. It's too much to train that type of distance and, you know, think about the dog. But mm -hmm. we, we have some avenues open for maybe either a new puppy. How long ago did Dante pass away? A month, a a month, month. ago. Yeah. So this is very fresh. Yes. Yeah, very fresh. Mm -hmm. But you've overcome other physical ailments. Yes. You said you had uh, breast I cancer. I had breast cancer. I had stage zero breast cancer, which by the time they operated on me, it was in size, it was stage one. So I liken it to the marathon. So I ran my first marathon, and then February, so four months later, I found out that I had this. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to treat this like the marathon. It can only be mile by mile. I can't think that far ahead. Because even at stage zero and stage one, you think, all of a sudden, your mortality is in front of you. I'm 32 years old. How is this possible? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I dealt with it. And I dealt with it through running. You better mm -hmm. believe every morning I got up. Thank God I got up, put my sneakers on, and went running. This has been a little bit different. I've not wanted to get up. But, right. you know, my teammates have been fantastic. They, like, knocked on the door yes. all weekend. You have, run, you have to run. You have to run. You have to run. And we, I have. Okay. You know, just, because of your teammates. Yeah. So, it's like Let's losing a child. Have, name names. Alexandra Hernandez, Lorraine Clark, Erica Hubbard, Catherine Callen, Jill Stats. What about Simply Rob? Simply Rob Vasilarakis. He is more taken um, the position that, you know, you'll run when you're ready. You know, everybody else is like, no, Joanne, you're going to get up and you're going to go running right now. Uh, interesting. A different approach. Different, different approach. But he's there for you when, oh my when God, you're yeah. ready. Yeah, yeah absolutely. One of my guests was a breast surgeon runner. So uh, we talked about, you know, that kind of cancer is the leading cause of death for women mm -hmm. beyond all other cancers. Yes. So how did you find yours? Was through shopping. Shopping. Yeah. Um, so if I may, on camera, uh, I, 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 you'll tell a lot about a woman from her breast and from the areola. And I went and I put on a shirt and your breast just looks wrong. And it just, I knew, like the minute I, I so I had a sheer shirt and I was like, well, let me try it on this way. And then I looked and it just was very different from even a week before. And I said, oh God. And I went to my doctor and she looked at me and she said, That's what, those were her words, oh God, just by looking. And I was very fortunate. Um, I worked at Bear Stearns. We had a lot of people that sat on the board of Memorial Sloan Kettering. I was fortunate enough to get to see a doctor in two weeks. I had surgery in four weeks, which is almost wow, unheard that's very of. fast. Yeah, and I had people that cared. Um, unfortunately, many underserved communities and underprivileged women, they don't have someone talking, speaking for them. They don't have a voice, um, which recently um, the Susan Coleman Foundation had a spokesperson that thought it would be a good idea to pull the breast program from Planned, Planned Parenthood. But who is going to speak for us? We don't all have bosses who can make a phone call mm -hmm. and care about us and mm -hmm. get, you know. And so that's been, you know, that's something that I care deeply about. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood Coma. because, you know, hey, listen, Planned Parenthood doesn't just do what, you know, what they're known for. They service women who have many different needs. One of them is breast cancer. Right. Yeah. Early screening, early detection, that's how we're going to stay yeah. alive. Especially especially on the privileged women that don't have the access to, you know, the, the health insurance, the high-end health insurances. Planned Parenthood is, is a big part of the communities, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. so. so I think you're also involved in, uh, in serving the underserved in your own way. Yes, I am. I am. You know, with, with the obesity epidemic that the United States faces right now, um, I think everybody just finding a way to get themselves active. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be lifting or running, just a walk, a brisk walk across town or, you know, walking to your next bus stop. Those type of little things, making the healthier choices at the dinner table with your family. And I think those type of things are going to help us as, you know, as individuals, as a family, and as a community, and as a nation. It just, it just trickles out. The trick is how do we expand? Are you involved with a specific organization? I'm part of the Rand Cortland Track Club as well. Joanne introduced me to competitive running. And as usual, I work hard. And I'm running and I'm training. And, and Van Cortland. boot camps for us. Yes, I've done some boot camps for the runners. I've also worked with a lot of runners that have injuries, uh, knee injuries, hip and ankles. I am uh, licensed to deal with uh, rehab, people coming out of rehab, like from a PT type mm -hmm. of atmosphere. I've seen runners come to me with bad ankles and bad knees and then 
the next maybe four months of us working together diligently run their marathon injury free oh, and pain free, yeah. And I've I've also ran the first mile or two with them as a symbol saying, hey, you know what, we did this together. And okay. I think that's major for both of us. Eric's run a couple of marathons himself. Oh, any favorites? Bear Mountain was. Oh. It was, a, it was an ultra marathon. I've ran two ultras. That's the 50 kilometers, and I've ran a 60 kilometer race. Well, you must know Michael Oliva. Yeah, of we yeah, do. we He's all on know. Our team. Yeah, He's he a knows. Good friend of ours. Yes, Mike Arnstein as well. They're, those are the ultra runners. Oh those are the elites. Yes, yeah. yes, they run. They, they show you the ropes. You're in good hands. And Michael yes. is a pretty good friend of ours. Yes, too. he is. He is. And you know, we also work together on the project of at least signing petitions with the friends of Van Cortland because we're trying very hard not to have the city pave our trails. The, the Putnam Trail. That's yes, right. Yes. Well, I had Mike here as a guest. The Putnam Trail exists now as a dirt trail through Van Cortland Park. It starts at the Westchester County border and runs south from there for 1.5 miles. It used to be a railroad line way back um, mm -hmm. in the early 1900s. Um, it was abandoned in the 50s. Uh, so the Parks Department unveiled a plan to pave the Putnam Trail. And uh, it's currently about eight feet wide, the Putnam Trail. So the parks unveiled a plan to pave it with asphalt and to double that width from eight to 16 feet. There was extreme opposition uh, within the local community to this. The plan had been going on for a couple of years. Um, so last year, Mike and I said, you know, all this opposition exists. You know, why don't we formalize it and uh, start a campaign to save this trail? You know, our goal was, you know, not to kill the project, but we wanted to keep the trail at its current eight foot width and to have it improved with a stone dust pro uh, stone dust surface. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, um, very recently I saw on their web page George Hirsch. He used to be the editor of New York Runners World mm -hmm. and he's the chairman of Road Runners. And he came out in support of not paving the road. That's he important. Signed a petition. Yeah, we've had, we have thousands of signatures and you know Michael Bloomberg just still wants to continue forward on the trajectory. I, I guess they figure they have the federal money, why not pave it? But the truth is as runners, as you know, it's so much better for our body to be on a trail than it is to be on the concrete or the asphalt. Yeah. We're dying for green space. It yes. It doesn't make any sense. And, yeah. and, you know, there's so many bikers in Central Park, it's not always safe for us, at least on the trail, if it's not paved, there are not as many bikers and it's much safer. Agree, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a battle. I want to cover some of your future challenges, Joanne. So I know you guys want to get a new pet, mm -hmm. but athletically, what do you, what do you see yourself do you, you want to get back into marathon? I want to overcome the sort of this all-encompassing sadness to get back to running um, happily. So uh, one of my other teammates, Heidi Velasquez, I cannot forget her because we've been going out at 5.30 in the morning running, you know, just three or four miles. Um, but I, I want to conquer more miles again. I want to get back into the, oh, yeah, you know, I can run 10 miles. I mean, of course I could. I just don't really want to yet. But I think maybe if somewhere I get a puppy or, or we rescue a puppy, mm -hmm. a Cane Corso, I think that will be my first step, getting back. So you got to get the same breed? Oh, absolutely. I would not ever get any other breed besides the Cane Corso. What yeah. about you, Eric? I just want to get better at my craft. I want to be able to just help more people, reach more people. Um, I mean, I'm really, I'm really involved right now in the nutritional aspect of fitness and nutrition being your foundation. So you don't have to spend hours in the gym if you eat right. You can do a short, efficient workout and still get the same results if you were working out for two hours, three hours. And uh, I think nutrition is, is the basis of just what you put in your body is what you get out at the end of the day. I, I definitely want to start getting my clients involved in their nutrition. You know, And it starts at the grocery store when they shop. You may have to go with them. <laughs> I've gone with them. <laughs> I've gone. I've gone into my clients' refrigerators and said, you know what, that's a no-no. Oh, my goodness. I've, I've Maybe done you that. Maybe do a reality show. I would love that opportunity, but I've, I've, done, I've done that, and, and my clients appreciate that. You know, it's not easy. It's not an easy, it's not an easy task. You do, it's a lot of time on your end. You know, it's a lot of time. You know, I love spending time with my wife. And it's, it's a lot of time, you know, away from home when you're that involved, you know. But it, it feels great to see that person reach that goal, 
you know, and people say, hey, you look totally different. And yes, not yes, to yes, plug yes. him because he's my husband, but he really has changed people's lives completely. And it's amazing how much we tie our body image to how we sort of feel yeah. about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's one client that, you know, that he has from the gym and I seen her, I've seen her get faster and faster and faster and her transformation. I mean, I can see that she feels better about herself. Um, so he's really, really great at what he does and he really does change people. I mean, not just their body, but what he changes their mind. You know, and that's, that's where it starts. You have to make the decision to eat better. You have to make the decision to hire a trainer. Mm -hmm. I mean, but then you have to make a decision to commit to yourself. Same way you and I have to make the decision to commit to 26.2 miles. I mean, this is lifetime. That's true. It's also it a lifestyle is. change. Yes. It is a lifestyle yes. change. And, and you got to make it slowly rather than jump in. Yes. You don't want to set yourself up for failure. But having a coach yeah. like yeah. Just to Eric, give you the path. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you again. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you having us. Thank you. Dante's in heaven. Oh, Dante's in heaven. Frolicking with all the other... He's, he's watching over us. ...cats and dogs and making St. Peter happy. Yes. yes. He is our yes. guardian angel. Yes, he is. Thank you. Thank you very much.